Welcome back. I am Norman von Schlock, and it has become incumbent upon me to introduce you to the second season of Cover to Coda, the podcast where we reach out with the scalpel to dissect the unknown, only to be dissected by the unknown ourselves. Leading you into the unknown is a sacrificial morsel known as Inks. Wait, sacrificial morsel? And the keeper of the ancient tome, Brinjanier. He, he, he does ancient, like books. Ancient, ancient and wielding the sacred artifact is the tapes. I do have a yes. rather large artifact, if I do say so myself. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to Cover the Cobra. Oh. oh, boy. Thank you, Von Schlecht. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. When do I get to my check? I uh, I want my money back, you, by the way, for the salt a... uh, the salt sea bath enema. Oh, not cheap. It it made my it made my tub messy. No. And the last time I bought your uh your meat uh facial scrub, it was uh, <laughs> definitely off. That was operator error, of course. You know what? Get out of here, Schleck. We don't no. want you here. This is our no, show. Please. Out of Out. the door. Out. My new book We're is slamming up. the door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, friends, we're back. We're back. We're back. It's Cover yes. to Coder Season 2. Uh, and it is our favorite time of year. It is mm. October. It is time mm. for Halloween. 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 Yes, we are so excited to have you guys back. That was such a beautiful intro. Can I just uh. say... I was expecting, I don't know what I was expecting. I was expecting. I, I had no idea. Spooky crypt noises, and I was yes. expecting tombs, but Freaks. I wasn't expecting this gothic. Do, 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 do. That, yeah. I loved well, it. It was beautiful. Yeah, it was well crafted. You know, I, I, I was going to go for like a, uh, you know, Tim Burton kind of thing. But then uh, all of a sudden, I just felt the rhythm uh, of the 80s in my, in my soul. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, and that, that's kind of what just, yeah, that that's belongs. what came out of my creative anus, just sort of, <laughs> you know, ejected <laughs> onto the keys. That belongs out of you. right next to Monster that's Mash right. on any of your compilations, any of your playlists, easily. Yeah, top there one in the charts right now, check yeah. it out. Uh, uh, Igor and the, and the Crypt Takers, the Crypt Keepers, yeah, yeah it's right there. Uh, Put well, your folks, purple people eater away. That's right. Well, or or leave it out. I don't I don't mind just <laughs> seeing the purple. We're not this here is to an judge. E this is an episode for all things floppy and purple people either. Mm. So that's right. That's where we're going, uh, are folks. We, are we talking uh ancient artifacts? Uh is this what Schleck was talking about? Your yes. ancient artifacts? Oh yeah, Norman von Schleck. He does uh, he, he does unfortunately ask to take pictures of everyone's ancient artifact. I don't know what he does with them, but if you want to get yeah. in the inner circle, just know He's going to snap some pictures. It's weird. It takes two seconds, but, you know, it's worth it for losing the, the you, sweat. You do it and you're done. You, you do it. You're you done. Do you it. love what you see. <laughs> <laughs> so, He's uh, a collector of smells. You just got to right. watch out around him. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of smells, we're back. Uh, I'm back here under the table with my boys. Uh, and, yes, it is October. The leaves are crunchy. The winds are blowing. And I, I know that the season is nearing. Because I woke up last night, very proud okay. Papa. It was uh, 12 o'clock. It was midnight. <laughs> I walk outside my door, and I look over at my Nilbog's room, and I can see this glowing light under her door. And oh. I'm, I'm like, this is weird. So I walk over. I open the door, and I couldn't be prouder. She's sitting straight up in her bed, practicing her 360 head spins and her projectile vomiting. No. I was just, Aww. I know. It was so it's a milestone. Sweet. It was a milestone. Uh, she's still working on her levitating uh, and the creepy eye rolling, but you know what? She's She'll get there. You know, she's getting there. Some dads are worried about their daughters, you know, and, and, and dating later on. I think you're covered. I'm fine. I don't think you have to worry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the 360 head spin and the projectile vomit pretty yeah. much take care of yeah, uh, only everything. Only love can break that spell. So. That's right. That's right. Well, folks, we have an awesome episode. We promised floppers, uh, and what we're talking to you about mm. from the cosmic void mm. is a Lovecraftian legacy. We're going to talk about Lovecraft covers. 
We're gonna talk about horror. It's gonna be awesome. But before we dive yeah. in, we have a few programming notes for you. All right. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm gonna go over these real quick. Uh, it's it's about this season, uh, or sorry, this month specifically, and some stuff about the season. So, right out the gate, uh, last season we received some great criticism about viewing the slides in the show. So before we had a long list and you had to click yep. through. Uh, and it was a bit of a mess, and we really apologize for not fixing it sooner. But, but, with some Inks magic, quite literally, we have a Inks new IT platform. Department. Yes, Inks IT here. We have yeah. a new platform, and this is what you have to do. Restart go to our it. website. Go to our website, www.coverdecoder.com. Yes. Click the Read More section on the episode you're listening to. And at the bottom, you're going to see a blue link that says Slides. Yes. Click on that, and it's going to open. This tome, this beautiful tome slideshow with all the images you need in one spot. So no more. Uh, there it is, folks. Yep. No more clicking on different links. It's one spot yeah. for all your links. So once again, uh, go to our website, coverdecoder.com, click read more on the episode, click the slides link, and you are in, folks. Yes. It's um, the same slides that we use to do our show, and so you'll be right along with us. You'll see exactly yep. what we see. Exactly. Yep. Just Strip slide down, down, easy to use. Uh, it's all there. Mm. It's all there. Beautiful. So uh, second over of business, this month is special. It's a special month. Special. And the reason it's special is because it's fucking October, okay? We love we love yeah, this bro. month. Yeah. We love fall. This is, my, this is my shit, bro. This is our jam, bro. So yeah, bro. B- because of that, each of us are doing our three Halloween essentials, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep, and there's going to be a episode every week, folks. You're getting cover to coder every week. Special. Special. Uh, however... There is a caveat to that, Ooh, uh, caveat. Which, yes, Ooh. which leads us to a Ooh. spooky final order mm. of business here. Yes. Patreon is open. Ooh. Uh. Yes, we have opened the Patreon gates, folks. Uh, so if you want to support us, it's two bucks a month. Uh, that's twenty four dollars a year. That's like a single like cheesesteak fry, bro. Yeah. At Tony's, at Rick that's, and Tony's. Yeah. You know, it's like that's like some smokes and some liquor down at the Packy. That's like Easy. one hand job at the Easy Clam, okay? Easy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah, two bucks a month, twenty four a year. Uh, join the Decoder Coven and become a cover cultist <laughs> right now. Uh, we actually uploaded the steak bites for you guys. It's just a bunch mm. of fun clips from season one, plus all the uh, intros that uh, Brengineer did. So uh, check that out. It's really cool. Uh, if you want to. Uh, support us. That's a really cool way to do it. It helps us out a lot. And the full episode is going to be our final Halloween essential. So once again, every week is going to be our two Halloween essentials and the Patreon episode will be our third. So uh, if you want to support us again, check it out and we would be grateful. So grateful. Yes. So without further ado, I think it's time to open up our minds, possibly our bodies, hey. for some sweet tentacle loving, and talk about the wacky, wide, horrible uh, <laughs> world that is HP Lovecraft. Yeah. All righty. Well, here's what I have for you, uh, fellas and the uh, listeners out there. Uh, I decided instead of just going into Lovecraft's de- sad, depressing. Uh, life and racist ideals, you know, we're going to touch, we're going to touch, we're going to reach out a little tendricle and just brush <laughs> Lovecraft's uh, back. little cheek. Um, but what I really want to do, because of his, his um, legacy is so far reaching, I want to touch on his legacy and covers. Beautiful. Um, and so, really, the start of H.P. Lovecraft and of modern horror and sci-fi and fantasy um, were, was the pulp magazines of yes. uh, the, the, the early 20s. Now, fellas, what's a pulp magazine? Let's start it off. What's a pulp awesome magazine? is what it is. It's this very dirty, large format magazine mm. uh, bordered with a color with fun 
bold Great. letters over the top yeah. with an amazing, amazing piece of art. And it's filled with basically uh, early sci-fi fantasy stories uh, and images to represent those stories that was put out, yeah. you know, I don't know, probably month monthly or or bi-monthly or something like that. Sometimes quarterly. Uh, yeah, it, quarterly. It was your early format for uh, horror and sci-fi. And crime and all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, you, you pretty much hit it on the head. Um, the the name Pulp Magazine uh, came from the paper quality. Uh, cheaply made paper uh, for what was considered at the time cummy, cheap, cummy. garish stories uh, yes. filled with horror and crime. Um, <laughs> lo- Detestable. Digestible, <laughs> disgusting. These um, puppies. Exactly. A lot of these um, these publications were super cheap to uh, print, uh, and so they ended up on the supermarket stands, uh, very cheap to buy. And so you had this entire uh, clientele of uh, young men and women buying these things and reading these stories. Um, I have my own. Copy Ooh. right here. Um, is that an OG? Of, is that the VOD? This is an uh, this is an OG Weird Tales. Wow. Beautiful. Uh, I believe this. How many this how many bins a, did you have to stuff your hand into to get that copy? <laughs> yeah, so I found this they in were a, um, an, an antique uh, mall, and this one actually contains part five of Herbert West, the Reanimator by H.P. Lovecraft. So that that's um, a cool thing. All, is there sometimes the stories yeah. were serialized. Yep. That's right. Um, and so if we go to the first slide here, you can you, you have an example of what the original Weird ta- oh, Tales yeah. magazines oh, look yeah. like. Yeah. So what we have here is Weird Tales, the unique magazine. What's going on in this cover here, fellas? It is the ghost table is the subtitle <laughs> there. And it is... Uh, spooky, this, spooky, spooky. <laughs> yeah, it's this uh, dapper gentleman holding out a gun um, to threaten the uh, the awful ghost table that's um, sitting very inanimately and uh, non-threatening, but it has it has a clow at the end of its um, at the end of the table leg and a, a sharp uh, claw, uh, a lion's head coming off the corner, and the damsel is uh, showing the palm to the table in, in order to protect. I'm, I'm thinking maybe no, some sort of force field. Not she's the putting table. Up. Uh, Not the but table. No, she, she's she's nearly fainting. And, is the uh, twist that these guys are high as fuck because they're afraid of a table? <laughs> it's like, a table. I mean, you can tell it's just back in the because it's like it's like I, I know how to get rid of ghosts. You just shoot them. You just send them yeah. back to hell <laughs> on the end of a lead bullet. Hold on, hold my hold my drink, baby. Well, I beat the shit out of this table. Yeah. So here you go. Uh, <laughs> one of the original Weird Tales. Um, magazines and in this particular issue, February 1928, arguably one of Lovecraft's most famous uh, stories uh, was published, and that is The Call of Cthulhu. Oh, um, yeah. If anyone isn't familiar, um, Cthulhu is a very uh, important horror monster creature. Uh, a godlike entity that has deeply set its tentacles in the pop right. culture. I guarantee you, way. you've seen some rendition of it somewhere. Oh yeah, you probably Absolutely. picked him as your playable character at some point. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You find you find Cthulhu um, as a cute plush toy. You find <laughs> yeah. it uh, in an episode of The Simpsons in one of the horror episodes. Oh yeah, South you, Park. You, South Park. You find it in South Park, uh, video games, tabletop games, all kinds of stuff. Love Lovecraft's creations um, are just a really uh, important Prolific. Uh, part of of sci-fi and uh, horror. Um, so this cover here was created by C.C. Senf. Um, now, C.C. Senf um, was a Prussian. This is back when Prussia was uh, a place. This is pre-World War I. And uh, Curtis Charles Senf um, came with his family to Chicago, mm. um, where his family had immigrated. Yes, they um, have many scary tables in Chicago. <laughs> 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 
Well, I'm not that's sure right. if that's the scariest table, but I've, I've had that for quite some time. <laughs> I've got a lot of memories ter- here. Tables in my time. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Now, C.C. Senf, uh, he went to school and studied art, and he basically basically became one of the best-known Weird Tale um, artists. And as you can see on the next the slide The guy who down, did Ghost Table? This is the guy who did Ghost Table. <laughs> he became the most popular. That's right. Dude, this is his well, He's, this one, is his he's one of the most well-known. <laughs> yeah, he, um, he painted uh, 45 uh, covers for Weird Tales. Wow. Oh, all right. Um, and, and also did uh, hundreds of black and white illustrations for the, uh, the uh, interiors of the magazines. Ooh, According those. to this paper, he was also a card jockey at a casino at some point, too. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he looks like he belongs on a riverboat for a, a riverboat <laughs> gambling yeah, He looks like uh, he's uh, in the, uh, the, the, the uh, barbershop quartet. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> there we are. Weird so, tales. So, if you come on down, you can see uh, three of his other works that he did of I his massive collection. You work. just you just had to put a dinosaur in there. You just had to put a I dinosaur in there, didn't you? That's worthy on this <laughs> yeah. page. Everything else, folks, just zoom in on the dinosaur right smack dab in the middle. Now, she may not be the flyest sauropod on the street, but she has power, and we can see the uh, magnificent rump glowing from the uh, the clouds and the sunset. That's a big and ass she's about dinosaur to do right there. A number on this little town. She's about to crush this church. This is a demon dinosaur from <laughs> hell. <laughs> now, uh, what what else is going on? In some of these covers over here, fellas. Oh man, a lot of uh, clothes ripping. A lot of damsels uh, being taken advantage of and possibly burned at the stake. Clothes Here's the cool thing. Sweat dripping. You don't expect pieces of art from this time to be so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess risque. But, I mean, we got we got titties bared. We got guys dressed up as, as demons. We got sacrifice going on. This is a very interesting era because yeah. uh, there is a lot of, of horror in these. We have a woman, yeah, about to be uh, pinned up on this cross, probably lit on fire. And then there's another one, this guy in this kind of devil dress is like taking her clothes off and taking her deeper into this castle. It's titled <laughs> Witch's Sabbath. Yeah. So hey, Come on, let's go play D&D. This, You're going to love it. <laughs> this stuff was coming out in the 20s, right? And so uh, the reason behind the graphic imagery is this was pre-code stuff. Yeah. So if you're if Pre-code. you're if you're not familiar with the code, um, you can learn about it in this fantastic book called The Horror. The Horror. Um, <laughs> the Horror. The Horror is about um, Congress. The Congress uh, hearings in the fifties, which basically <laughs> accused um, comic book uh, authors and uh, comic book and um, fiction publications of printing lewd material stuff that had rotting corpses on the covers was banned. Anything with nudity was banned. You're responsible for my son's carpal tunnel. You hear me? That's right. He keeps taking those magazines and sneaking (laughs) off into his room for hours on end. Deplorable. I'm confiscating all these. Don't come in here. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. So, um, so anyways, these covers here are all by CC Senf. And the interesting thing is he was a Prussian man um, who came over with his family. He was an immigrant. Now, who hated immigrants? Um, well, we could point a giant finger at H.P. Lovecraft, maybe. <laughs> exactly. H.P. <laughs> H. Lovecraft... Uh, the brilliant mind that uh, he had for horror um, and sci-fi and science was a man who was a massive bigot. He uh, couldn't stand immigrants. He couldn't stand people of color. Um, he couldn't stand the poor. <laughs> Basically, um, he hated unless, everybody. He he, yeah. he just hated everybody unless you were a, a white male, and if you were a white female, he was probably very very uncomfortable of you. So this is H.P. Lovecraft we're talking about here. So a little bit into Lovecraft's life. Lovecraft had a really uh, pretty gnarly childhood. Um, I tell you all this history as information. This is what happened to him. This is in no way uh, trying to explain away his uh, viewpoints 
Um, the poor or, man. The oh. poor man. <laughs> no, uh, a, it HP affects the was, covers. It affects the material. That's right. The material it, it affects does. the covers. It definitely does. The covers affect the decoders. Exactly. So this is the man whose uh, stories went behind these covers, these weird tales covers, these astounding stories covers. Uh, this is a man who got his... Um, he never really found fame in life. Uh, he had basically his small following of people who loved reading his stories. But during his life, uh, he had nothing. He died penniless uh, in 1937. So uh, just a real quick mini biography of Lovecraft. Uh, he was born in 1890. And like I said, he died in 1937. Um, he was born uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, a place he cared deeply about. And um, a lot of his stories... Uh, take place in Providence, and he spent his entire life in New England. He didn't travel around much. Uh, much he pretty much stayed um, mm. in New England. Um, so his his grandfather uh, was an affluent businessman growing up. Uh, Lovecraft was born into wealth, but uh, fortune sort of changed for the Lovecraft family. Um, in 1893, his father uh, Winfield. Winfield Lovecraft. Oh, yes. oh, Winfield. Oh. Well, he had a psychotic episode, and he was committed. Now, Winfield died five years later, um, due to a psychosis, Ooh. due to the dick rot. Oh, Whoa. oh! He, he, he had, down, he had uh, syphilis. He had, he, had, he, had, he, had he, he went and met old Siffy down at the tavern. <laughs> he met old That's Siffy right. Lass. <laughs> Oh, now, no. in 1898, uh, there was no penicillin. There wasn't any cure for the SIF. Uh, once you got it, uh, your Johnson dropped off. It yeah, just sex ed off, class folks. was like very a, different. That's, that's right. That, yeah. <laughs> don't get <laughs> syphilis, or your, your penis shall fall straight off your body. No. Yeah, don't, don't be like Lovecraft's father over here. And, of course, Lovecraft was just like, yes, my dad got syphilis. Uh, he, uh... He, uh, he was a very uh, distraught Actually, man. Yeah. No, he wasn't he, like that at all. He was like, no, my father died of a mysterious, spooky illness. Uh, insanity. Mm -hmm. Ooh, he yeah, was haunted by yeah. ghosts. Well, well, well roping That's right. Cthulhu is on the coast. Yes, he was right. hunting. He had a spear in one hand and, yes. a, and a knife in the other. Uh, no dick angry. That's right. Uh, Lovecraft never truly accepted, or at least outwardly, uh, the, true, the truth behind his father's fate. Um... So after his father's death, Lovecraft's mother is just spoiled and rotten. She was pretty um, overbearing. Uh, they were ba basically best friends, uh, Lovecraft and his mother. If uh, I may add in that too, sort of codependent. Lovecraft's mother also mentally abused him by telling him that he was ugly. He would tell oh. him that he was ugly yep. and that no one would love him except for his mother okay, because so, she was so yeah. afraid that she would lose him. So basically, and the he is a pretty goofy looking dude. Yeah, yeah. She, yeah. she wasn't half wrong about him. She wasn't half. Wrong. <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta tell the truth. <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta tell the truth. Um. So Lovecraft's uh, grandfather, Whipple. Whipple. This guy's name was Whipple. <laughs> Whipple. Whipple. The tripper. That's right. Uh, became Whipple my father, Lovecraft. And uh, encouraged Lovecraft at a young age to appreciate <laughs> literature. And this included <laughs> gothic literature and early horror, um, which Lovecraft took to. Um, Lovecraft was very literate and could read and write by the age of three years old, which is highly uh, impressive. This, this downturn of fortune continued all through his life. Um, his mother died. His uh, marriage that he was in completely fell apart. Um, like I said, he never found any success in his work. Dude, um, this guy was such a loser. His wife had to dole him out money. She had him on like an allowance. Why did, why did he, he lose so much? Why was he like, why did he, what was going on with the family fortune? Um, they all lived together in a house and Whipple's business <clears throat> transactions oh. just sort of fell apart. And because of that, um, the strain, I guess, Whipple had a stroke and died. Whoa. This is and called that left Betamax. It's going to be huge. It's going to be bigger than VHS. <laughs> I got a bunch of it. Come, in, come over here. H we got to unload all these Betamax. <laughs> so what you guys uh, also don't understand. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. What's going on here? <laughs> no. No. So, so part of the reason Lovecraft was inspired by all these uh, 
very interesting octopoidal creatures was because he was shown a very... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. A very oh, no. early wood, wood <laughs> of Heavily Dream of the Fisherman's Wife. All right, all right. Yes. So, he, so, so here's wh- the thing. This, Whipple, this, wait, real quick. This is not just so you get the context of what we're looking at. We we are not showing this on our slideshow. <laughs> But basically, uh, um, uh, tapes here is decided to put on a Japanese ink block image of an octopus giving a woman uh, some it, cunnilingus. It's octopoidal cunnilingus. Ooh. Now, Whipple brought uh, this over this with him. This is so disturbing. After Why? one of his particular journeys. Now, this was done by, yeah, this was done by a Japanese artist named of Katsuki uh, Hokasu. I'm very sorry, Hatsuki Hokasu. I'm sorry about your ghost. You're dead for many years. This is a piece of, uh, I believe it's called Shunga art. We'll go into this later, but I just thought you folks might like to see. This is an early nightmare for H.P. Lovecraft, and this is why he couldn't have sex, and this is also why he loved octopoids. So, there you go. <laughs> can, can you make this picture go away now? <laughs> I think it's, okay, I think I just... it's a, a source of inspiration for him, because that octopus... Is not the handsomest octopus. It's it's <laughs> ugly. You might it it kind of looks like, like a poor little boy looks from like, uh, Lovecraft. Providence, Rhode Island. Yet he is scoring. The He's fact scoring of the matter is just on his er, skills alone. Er, <laughs> dude, the, hey bro, the things he can do with that beak are uh, yeah, uh, pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if I had eight arms. Don't don't show your children early Japanese woodblocks. They're no. beautiful pieces of art. But maybe just save those for a little bit later. Anyway, sorry, Brengineer, continue. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> All right. So that's where I'm going to stop with Lovecraft's uh, life. His his life um, is very interesting. There's lots of books written about it. You should definitely check him out more. Um, there's just not enough time to give his full history. No. Um, yeah. You know, the in-depth, uh, you yeah. know, the, the in-depthness that it needs. <laughs> I mean, there, there are rumors that- the most important parts. The the death death being lost to Betamax, the octopoids, the uh, yeah, the, <laughs> the <mean Cunnilingus>. octop- <laughs> octopus. Um, <laughs> but the most important thing about Lovecraft was his work. Uh, we're talking at the Mountains of Madness, oh. the Call of Cthulhu, mm. oh. Dagon, oh. the Color Out of Space, the ah. Shadow uh, over mm. Innsmouth, mm. the Dunwich Horror. These yeah. are just really um, classic, uh, perfect examples of of some of his best work. Um, and definitely things you should check out. Now, um, some of these works create what is known as the Cthulhu mythos. Um, Lovecraft was very inspired by um, writer Lord Dunsany. Lord Dunsany is uh, an insane writer uh, in cool. his own right. Pretty cool. A beautiful writer, an insane history. Um, he was like a crazy... Uh, he was a lord. He was a big game hunter. He fought in all these uh, really? wars in Africa. Yeah, that 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 whole thing. I believe um, I shall try my hand at science fiction writing. Yeah. Oh, well, this is talk. like killing a, a buffalo. That's right. <laughs> and so Lord Dunsany, he came up with a pantheon of gods, and he wrote he wrote about them like they're just. That's just what they are. They've always been around. I don't need to go into them. This is, you know, the great God, this, the great God, that, so on and so forth. No explanation or exposition needed, right? And so Lovecraft kind of latched on to this. There was, there's like yeah. realism behind that of just saying. It's, it's the coolest part of his legacy is that yeah. he started this style of, of you just go. You just start talking about yeah. it and you don't really yeah. describe or, or, or talk about it. They're just there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so he created this pantheon of God. There was uh, Cthulhu and Yog sothoth and Azathoth and these different gods. And you learn um, through his various stories, which have dis- uh, interconnecting cities. Um, they share characters. You, you get this whole dark world yeah. controlled by these creatures that don't give a crap about you. They don't yeah, give yeah. a crap about your world. They simply exist in a different time um a different space but that veil between their world and ours is very thin and occasionally uh they let themselves known to certain cultists 
who then try to bring them across the veil into our world and the scientific minds who discover this and try to stop these cults. So it's this very dark, very strange, um, very uh, horrific kind of fiction that a lot of people have really uh, latched onto over the years. Yeah, uh, the name kind of for it now has, has been titled Cosmic Horror. Yeah. If you hear Cosmic Horror, that's what Lovecraft is is sealed, is cattle branded for creating. Yeah. Among and others. The import- yeah, the important thing about Lovecraft's... Um, uh, horror is that it stripped away all the gothic stuff, right? Right. <clears throat> he, he started uh, publishing his first stories in 1917 uh, after World War I. So in World War I, you have men witnessing the real horrors real uh, horrors. of the world. Real horror. I mean, a, a rotting corpse isn't scary anymore because you spent you know the last two years in ditches full of rotting corpses. Yeah. Right. Um, you you come to realize that the, the the true monsters on Earth are the humans, are other humans who who want to kill you, or powers uh, above you like governments who don't give a crap about you and about your life. They yeah, just man. want uh, a few more feet <laughs> yeah, of, of this useless territory. Yeah, man. Man, I mean, like, I was smoking our... this joint, dude, and I was, like, thinking about the world and the government. Yeah, and, like, dude. don't give a crap, man. The lack of evidence is the evidence, bro. And so here we have it. A, a new a new form of effective horror evolved, and that was uh, these giant beings uh, looking down on you. They don't care. They're going to... They're going to um, take you over. They're going to kill you. They're going to destroy the world. Or they're just using you. Um, so once Lovecraft died, you had these other weird fiction authors around the country and around the world who were uh, sort of starting to write these Cthulhu mythos uh, pieces. And better writers, I will add. Yeah. And much better writers. I, I've got to um, ask real quick. Am I the only one who imagines Lovecraft having like a lisp? Talking with the list because listening to his god names, you got Cthulhu, Athagoth, uh, <laughs> um, I just there's a lot you know, of the, the funny thing about Lovecraft is he spells out the names, but they're supposed to be unpronounceable by like the human oh, tongue. Oh, yeah. yeah, so you know, it's like Cthulhu, but it's probably just like. <laughs> 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 so, um, a couple of these famous uh, authors were August Derleth and Donald. Wandry, hmm. um, oh, oh. they were they were putting out they were putting out some uh, weird fiction and some Lovecraftian uh, cosmic horror, and they were pen pals of Lovecraft. Uh, this is back in the day; you had pen pals, and these guys were like writing to each other all the time, bump you know bumping ideas off each other's heads and talking about you know what they're working on. And so when Lovecraft died, these two guys got together and they wanted to publish the first book of Lovecraft's collected works. Okay, so which one's Jeremy Irons and which one's... Uh, <laughs> Robert De Niro? <laughs> Robert De Niro, yeah. So um, uh, I'm going to go with John Hurt. So John Hurt okay. is uh, Donald Wandry. Oh, it is John Hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, hey. yeah, the other guy. You're looking at me? Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. hey. you want to uh, publish his work? Yeah. You want to publish his work? Guy. I'll break your knees. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's August that Derelith. August Derelith. Okay. Um, and they weren't, they weren't finding anyone willing to publish a Lovecraft, uh, a, a Lovecraft book. Okay, to me, this so is they, good uh, literature. That's this right. is so, love crap. You hear me? This is love crap. You hear me? Hey, um, come on. Take my book. Derelith, Derelith and Wandry um, <laughs> decided, let's just start our own publishing house. And so they yeah. created yes. Arkham House Publishing. I love that. Start don't, our own don't jump house. on the horse. Get off the horse. Jump mm. on a buffalo. That's what you do. Be yeah. You do your own thing. You know, if someone doesn't want your stuff, um, pu- release it yourself. You know, it's it's tough. Um, I've done lots of self releases. It's not easy, but it is worth it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I self release all the time, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Just look at some Japanese uh, ink, ink box blocks, and then you're good to go. <laughs> I look at some 1700th century ink yeah, blocks. You gotta take care of yourself sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> So, so what we have in this slide is the Outsider and Others, um, which is the first uh, H.P. Lovecraft omnibus of his fiction. Oh, it was published in 1939. Look at this piece. Oh, I love it. With cover art by Virgil Finley. Oh, saxophone is playing. 
I feel like I'm getting a cabaret <laughs> dance. <laughs> so what, what are we looking at here? Dude, okay, so first of all, let me just say, I love that you found this, Brengineer. So I actually, I follow Virgil Finlay on uh, Instagram, folks. Check him out if you have an Instagram. His artwork is so beyond its time and amazing and creative. And his his art, I don't understand. It looks like McMiniman's art. But before McMinimins existed with digital art, <laughs> okay, you know what I mean. Local, like local now, definition for everyone uh, listening around <laughs> the uh, <laughs> who's not in the Portland area. McMinimins is like a it's like a funky, spooky kind of place where you can get a drink. Uh, man, there's paintings and uh, weird art all over the place, and the creepier the, the better. But it's the best all done with this kind of. I've ever had in my life, brother. It's all done with this kind of style. So this image is so freaking cool and this is what i love about virgil is his stuff is so out of the box it's got all these stars uh and it's got there's a lady in the back of one and each mm. one has kind of a different monster face or, or a tentacle popping out Security. and above you have this space uh with these stars and his style is i i don't know what so what is this called or here's the thing i don't know what this is it looks like ink it looks like ink and pen um, yep, it's uh, his his primary uh, medium was pen drawings. Yeah, and so okay. he okay. used uh, stippling, yeah. which is to say you take your pen and you just do little dots. Yeah, and your dots uh, make up the shading. Yeah, so that's what he's doing here. Yeah, it's, you it's just like, fist it's the like paper your, your over pen, and over again. That's right. Pen is getting yeah a little bit of self release going on at the very end, <laughs> and you just get that rapid movement going, and you can stipple and create all kinds of uh, depth with dots. Death That's right. Dots. And and by the time by the time you've done 10 minutes of this, uh you'll know the meaning of carpal tunnel. Yes. How do you, how do you create this with that? It doesn't make sense. Do you outline time. it? Oh yeah. It's a lot of a lot of time. Yeah, you don't have Folks. to outline it. It just I mean, it's a very instagrammable thing too where you see people doing these little postage stamp things and creating really cool artwork with just uh with the uh, with a micron and uh and a piece of paper. You can create all this depth, and that's what's cool about this um, this uh, cover is that it's literally two colors and probably yeah. you know a handful of pens, and he created this masterpiece. So it's insane. Yeah, uh, yeah. you know what? You don't need all of the fancy stuff. You don't need the tablet. You just need a piece of nope. paper and a pen, right. and you can you can create Lovecraftable deliciousness. I can't That's wait to right. jump into Virgil Finlay because, folks, he has uh, – I'm sure Brent Jr. is going to talk about it, but he has a bank of phenomenal art. Bank. He, he, he has made over 2,600 uh, works of art in his 35-year hmm. career. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, so you can see down here we got another one. This was um, another uh, Lovecraft book. Marginalia, which is a book of his uh, short works and poetry and things like that. Another just really, I mean, insane piece. Scrumptious. Is this cross hatching and stippling too? Uh, it is. It is. It's just, yeah, it baffles my mind. I just don't understand. It must be. It must be giant. Definitely check out some of Virgil's work. It's fantastic. It's uh, it's moody. It's atmospheric. It's technically detailed. Uh, if you if you want to be a pen and ink kind of artist uh he he is a person to look for oh absolutely the check Ritz. him out paragon that's right now uh a few more here um by uh arkham house uh a couple of my favorites actually we have a cover by lee brown coy which is one of my favorite covers uh for another collection of macabre tales called <laughs> dagon <laughs> Look at his eyes. This guy's got some serious eyes. Pop those peepers back in, bro. Yeah, what are we looking at here? Oh, man. This is, this is, I've seen this before, actually. Uh, and this is an awesome piece. It's got these giant, chunky letters in red that say Dagon. And then the rest of it is this black and white image of this very scary looking old uh, <laughs> Imp Appala man. Appalachian in inbred grandpa. <laughs> With a spear. Yeah, I'm telling you about the time when I went a bit of whaling. Stabbing a whale in the eye with a harpoon. And it is, it's kind of goofy, but it's goofy in kind of a scary way. It's goofy in the best way possible. Yeah, it's very macabre. Macabre. 
if you've read if you've read the uh, story Dagon, I mean, this cover makes no sense for that. But um, <clears throat> now, <laughs> easily one of my favorite uh, covers of of the collection is of this the stuff a, put out is by this Arkham. a molded turd. Yeah, it looks this like looks some like sort someone of, molded a human okay, piece some of, sort of self release artifact. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It looks a lot like a fecal dildo. Mm. Yes, I'll just it put does. that out there. Um, so this <laughs> this one uh, <laughs> this this is a very interesting piece, and here's why. This there's I'll actually say. some history. I was I was beyond happy when I I saw this cover. Like I got really <laughs> excited. So. For for me, my you know I have strong opinions. Really about things. When excited. I, when, I, when I see something I don't like, I have no problem saying, I don't, yeah. I, I don't really care for that. You know that, that's kind of my thing. It is now his normally, thing. now normally, you know th- this is not a good cover, but it's a it's an amazing cover and it's terrible in the best way possible. This is for a book. <laughs> <laughs> a book called uh, Beyond the Wall of Sleep, which is one of Lovecraft's famous stories. Um, and it's just this really brown, it's just a brown Dude, cover. It's got brown opacity. It's like an it's just pink. Yeah. Brain. <laughs> so I don't know. It's like, it's like brown going to gray. I don't even know. And it's got this really, these two horrible, like artifact looking things on there. Now, here's why I was so excited about this cover. There was a weird fiction author, the best weird fiction author in my in my opinion um astounding an astounding writer uh by the name of clark ashton smith who oh was this clark ashton clark ashton smith who Star. was the strange uh, hermit style uh man who lived up in uh the north uh california mountains california mountains and he hung out in this cabin uh playing with his 50- own poop for 50, 60 years <laughs> in obscurity, writing stories, writing poetry, um, you know, never really making a name for himself in his life, but has gone on to be one of the most beloved uh, science fiction horror writers of all time. Beautiful now, writing. Beautiful writing. Uh, there is a, there's a saying that one sentence of Clark Ashton Smith's writing is better than entire books. And of that, I completely agree. I'm, I'm totally absorbed in his writing. I would say more so than, than Lovecraft. Um, but an interesting thing, an interesting thing about Clark Ashton Smith is while he was writing, he was also drawing these insane pictures and he would go into this mine and collect these, uh, this stone, I guess it was a soft, like pumice style stone that was by his cabin and he would sit around and carve <laughs> these sculptures. <laughs> this is <laughs> so yeah. It's a soft pumice. I, I swear. It's a soft pumice. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> and he carved numerous amounts of these strange little sculptures, and he would just hide them around his property. And um, for a while, people would just go there and try to find his weird sculptures that he left sitting around. Hey, look, Jimmy. Um, there's another one of uh, Ashton's poop sculptures. Yeah, just we found your it. Nose. Let's hold your nose. You know, after a few years, the smell will wear off and it'll, it'll be fine. It'll desiccate. Put it on the mantelpiece. <laughs> That's so cool. I love. I love this idea of this guy who writes all these stories, turns into a hermit, and he just walks around all day making weird sculptures. Yeah, and just leaving them around. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, Live smell your, your brand. own brand. Love it. So anyways, I am holding up my own Arkham House uh, book here. This is uh, New Tales of the Cthulhu Mythos. Oh, just a beautiful look book. look at the red. They were known for just making really just tight-bound, beautifully pressed books. Um, well done, Arkham House. It. Well done. Well done, Quality. Arkham House. I now, will say, too, end- this, uh, this cover has inspired me to write my first erotic weird tale called Brown on Brown. <laughs> I love that. Classic. Classic. Absolute classic. 50 Shades now, I'm gonna of Brown. Ra- we're we're, we're going to wrap up with probably the most famous, the most well-regarded, the most beautiful Lovecraft cover of Queen. all time. Queen of all Queen. The, Queen, the Queen of the Quap. Queen now, of the Quap. Um, in the 80s, Del Rey um, decided to do a seven or eight uh, volume um, paperback release of Lovecraft's work. Now, who should they go ahead and get to do the arts for this? Only 
the greatest sci-fi fantasy artist of all time. Michael Whalen. All right. I always get the biggest art to choder when Waylon comes yeah, up. Chubber to choders. Those happen. Now, this is a, uh, a diptych, which is uh, two panels. Um, and Del Rey basically wanted a big enough issue that they could crop different sections from the big painting and use uh, for each of their covers. And, I mean, who wants to go? Who, who wants to even go into this and, okay. and describe what you're seeing? Well, first of all, folks, we're going to, we're going to cliff notes this thing because... You have to look at it for yourself. We're yeah. going to go in segments because this thing, it's, it's, it, there's too much to go into the full detail. But you know what? I'll take the first panel. Uh, and what we have is this gigantic, eggy, pussy eye <laughs> with like sort of the fish lens going over it. It's a human eye, but it's got the goat oh, yeah. eye lens in bright red. And, and so you know, this whole thing is silver. Uh, grays and pops of red. That's what, what the whole thing is. White. Bumple pearls. Yeah, bumple eggy things popping out of the eye. Mm. Next to the eye, you have this figure who is clearly still alive in agony, wrapped in uh, spider webs with this red thing, beetle spider thing, crawling into his dong area <laughs> to get a little, <laughs> get a little uh, fang little nipple, little fang action. Uh, and next to next to him you have the not the, tree. the dog, not <laughs> the the dog. Well, I was gonna say next to him you have the tree of sorrow covered in Nicolas Cage's faces going not the dog no. <laughs> uh, and this tree of sorrow has all these red eyes and it looks like something off a loadout screen in one of the original Doom uh, games. Yeah, <laughs> and that's then so true. Below the tree you have a pile of skulls. Uh, next to that you have this weird pillar of of. Uh, ribs covered in blood and finally very oddly but kind of making sense is this stack of bricks with this uh scary looking beetle uh standing it's upright a, it's a wooden box it's a wooden box it's standing hands. on and okay. there's hands reaching out of the cracks yeah that's the scariest uh. one for me because that beetle is real those exist down in texas there's these things called cottonwood borers AKA Ooh. the upright flying demon beetle from Inks' Nightmares. They fly oh, upright because they beetle. like to latch onto trees and they're about the size of like a piece of gum. Just Dude, do they crawl do they crawl into your dick tip too? Dude, coming at you? Yeah, if you go down to the last <laughs> slide, I got a picture of that demon beetle up there. Ooh, oh, look at yeah. him. Yeah. Oh, he's coming to that's it. He's coming to lock your babies in a box. Look at that. Yeah, thing. he's he's coming to crawl into your sack and 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 do some damage. So that's panel one. Inks, why don't you take panel two? Okay, moving on from the evil cotton borer beetle up there, um, we've got a necromancer showing off his goods to his Tinder date, <laughs> so she can see <laughs> his uh, you see his, my wicked, bone? his wicked his uh, wicked oh. rib abs, aka just his ribs showing. And crawling at, his, <laughs> crawling at his feet is like this spiky uh, turd. Uh, snake thing. Uh, <laughs> just so you know, folks, everything looks just like a turd. Everything yeah. is turdy somehow. This is the this is this is like the turd from hell. Because if you pass that sucker, I'm telling you what. This and is it's even got a. This face is if on you head. ate if you ate fortune cookies all night long, and they were just poking out the sides like like spikes. <laughs> That's yeah. what this thing looks like. You <laughs> ate nothing but fortune cookies and rock yeah. candy. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't swallow <laughs> tortilla chips whole kids. Um, <laughs> and then next is a uh, a brick build like a piece of a brick building but there's a window leading into a dark figure uh, holding up a Candle and the figure, I can't really see that well. From it's Gary Oldman, the, it's Gary Oldman from Dracula. <laughs> this is creepy, yeah. This creepy, easily my favorite figure. portion. Look yeah. what your god has done to me. <laughs> and, then, and then moving on is um, the, the Anderson's uh, Halloween decoration yard 
that everyone's <laughs> jealous of. There's goddamn Andersons are putting out their Halloween decorations and trying to show I them. I put up a mummy and again. they put up yeah. a, a you know, bunch of skeletons. Some of us have got to work 40 plus hours every week and they don't have the time to put up these <laughs> this cool boneyard and skeletons that are, are, are uh, dotting the landscape leading up a stairway to some sort of necro, some sort of wizard casting a spell with a dark cloud leading up to these um, winged creatures that have multi eye stalks and bat wings and 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 rooty uh, tendricles coming off the back. It's nuts. It's this guy bananas. was literally he was taking essence of Halloween. He and he was yep. snorting it through his butthole. Oh, these are these are great covers because you this. can just stare at them. And these are these That's are road right. trip covers where you sit in the back of the seat and you just stare That's at right. the cover yep. and and you go to another world and you haven't even cracked the book yet. That's right. So these are acrylic on board. Ooh. What? Um, what? Yep, acry- acrylic on board. And, wow. Uh, Never ceases this- to amaze. That's right. Uh, Unreal. You will see portions of this cover on uh, various, uh, no surprise, heavy metal uh, albums. Um, this portion here, the Necromancer, appears on an album by Demolition Hammer. Hmm. And then this uh, front portion uh, is used on... Obituary? Obituary! There we go. Obituary used this front the front panel. So. Hey! Uh, there you go. So did it's they, just, be they, on, they uh, just take the artwork and license it out? Yeah. Yeah, it seems like it. That that you should do kids go out there and spend two years on a diptych uh painting with all the juicy goodness and then just, you know license it. License that. Yeah, license the heck out of it. Licensing is legit, folks. Yep, for sure. Wow. For engineer, this that, is amazing. And that's man. what I got. That's my history of Lovecraft. <laughs> In covers, there are countless Lovecraft covers. I mean, you probably can't you you'd never collect them all. Mm. No, nope. uh, they release new ones all the time, inexplicably. I mean, I have multiple Lovecraft volumes which contain the exact same stories. I just buy them because all the covers are so freaking cool. It's so hard not to, and they they always do them in these amazing leather bound tomes now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Folks. I've got them wrapped in faux leather. I've got them uh, <laughs> boxed up in boxes with nice like linen coverings. I've got yeah. paperbacks. I've got hard covers. I got a lot of Lovecraft so, in my folks, collection we need because the you covers to, are so cool. We need you to sign up for Patreon so that we can eventually pay for the long operation that we're going to have to get for Bringineer because <laughs> of all the dust and, all the and, book, and, spending. and book mildew he's huffed over the years just digging into uh, bins and surrounding himself with old tomes. So, um, you, you know, eventually you're going to have to I save say? a life. And, and, and Eventually. Yeah. So this, it, your your dollars are going for more than just uh, awesome covers. That's right. Well, thank you, Brengineer. That was awesome. Uh, really cool, folks. Like like Brengineer said, there are some great documentaries. If you want to learn more about Lovecraft the person, uh, that that you can check out. There's one that's awesome with Neil Gaiman, uh, yeah. John Carpenter, mm. and a bunch of awesome horror uh, inspired so uh, writers, directors. Uh, go check them out on YouTube. They're free. You can watch them. But it's good to know because where we're going next is going to delve into more of the the hard stuff about Lovecraft. Because as we talked about, Lovecraft's camp is very important, but Lovecraft the person still needs to be recognized. So we titled this episode A Lovecraftian Legacy. Right. And we did we did that for a reason. Because this episode is is not to celebrate Lovecraft the man, Mm-mm. but the worlds and innovative themes he helped to cement. So we are talking about Lovecraftian covers because, as Brent Engineer said, there are so many great artists and stories inspired, uh, and indeed some awesome tales of his as well, which also inspired people. But we cannot forget the fundamental truth that Lovecraft was an incredibly flawed human being, not nice. He was a racist. Mm-mm. He was a white supremacist. He was Not a bigot. Uh, he was xenophobic. Come on. Uh, he cared. He he honestly he he could care less about humans in general. Um, and one of his main themes, in fact, is that humans are just this tiny little in, uh, insignificant speck in an uncaring world. Um, like Brengineer said. So the question a lot of people are asking now, because this has come up a lot, yes, is how do we reckon with Lovecraft? What is his legacy? 
Uh, and we're going to get to that. But as Brengineer did so beautifully, we're going to do this the cover to coder way, and we're going to do it through covers. So, boys, pull up the first slide here. Yeah, pull up the first slide, and what we're going to be looking at, folks, is Lovecraft Country. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Mm. It's beautiful. So, so good. before we... Before we go into it, this was a novel, uh, 2016, by Matt Ruff, Harper Collins Publishing. Uh, the artist we have to thank for this is Jared Taylor. We're going to talk about him a little bit more. Uh, oh, it's so cool. It's so cool. Before we get into the cover, I found this book because of the show. Uh, and this rarely happens for me. Uh, occasionally it does, but Lovecraft Country, of course, by now everyone knows it's almost it's almost finished, is a HBO series. And uh, when we were doing the show, I wanted to talk about we all kind of wanted to talk about the issues with Lovecraft, but we um, we wanted to find the right medium to do it. And Lovecraft Country came out, and it was it's the way to do it. It was a beautiful sign from the unearthly portal of the other world. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I looked into it. I didn't know Lovecraft Country was a, a book before the show. Did you, boys? I did not know this. No. 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 So, same here. And I found out it was a book, and it was perfect. So, so good. Let's talk about the cover. Who wants to go? So, what we're looking at here is it straight up looks like an old pulp magazine. Absolutely. Um, it's got the wear and tear around the edges. It's got that red color in the background. The font. The font is straight up so that big, perfect. bold, uh, you know, pulp Drop font shadow. That you pulpy. see the drop, drop shadow, white lettering with the red. Um, it's a pretty simple cover. Um but the images, what it shows is very effective. And it says essentially there's a mount um, and a top sur surmounting the mount is what <laughs> looks like a, a church or a stone uh, cult building. Um, it's a got, got a culty, culty lodge feeling yeah, to it. A lodge, yeah. For sure. And there's a sun, um, a sort of spiky uh, sun coming out from the back. And down below is the most interesting part because so, blowing yep. up, blowing up, you have what look like ghosts, except they're probably not ghosts. No. They're probably looking at the hoods of clansmen. Yeah. Right? Yes. And actually, when you really think, when you really look at them, it's, it's almost impossible to think of them anything other than clansmen. Right. Um, just because of how pointed he, uh, Ooh, pointy, pointy. Jared did a, he did a great job of pointing up yep. uh, further to make you realize, like, wait a minute, these aren't yeah. ghosts. This is great because yeah, it, it implies he, yeah. a lot without showing it directly. Yep, exactly. And then you would think that's all, except no. around around each of the KKK hoods are these strange little round red marks. Bumples. And you realize Ooh, that those are little suckers. Yes. Ooh. And... Um, yeah, uh, that this mounts that this uh, cult lodge is is atop is actually some sort of uh, octopodal creature. Yes, yes, very cool, folks. Very it's cool. a super cool, and it's got these great these great uh, taglines: uh, a new oh, yeah. novel, and and just it, it America's looks like America's demons exposed. Yes, it looks like something you would pick hot off the press. Uh, that would be just filled with amazing schlocky yeah. stories. Uh, but this book is anything but that. No. Um, we're going to get into that in just a minute. But real quick, Brengineer, you did a great job. But folks, why don't we hear it from the man himself? Ooh. Because Ooh. huge thanks to Gerard Taylor. I, I went ahead and I sent him an email uh, asking him some questions about the cover. Oh, really? And he responded. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And he nice. responded to us. Oh, yeah, so cool. folks, yeah, we promised you last season. We're getting you interviews, so here Boom. we go. Inks, if you don't mind, I believe we could use a little dramatic flair for this yes. interview. Yes, yes. So I'm calling upon Sir Reginald Inks, Inksforth <laughs> oh, I will be. to play the, to play the oh, part oh. of Gerard Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> as, as a great artiste. 
Yes, I, 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 I say it all begins with the brush, and there's never no rush when you have the brush, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Okay, so folks, I'm going to read these uh, as as I ask them, and Inks is going to is going to play the part of Jared Taylor. So here we go. How were you selected to design this cover? Well, I was working in an art department for HarperCollins when the book was being published. Um, when I heard about it, I begged my boss to let me have the shot at this cover. Yeah, that's awesome. So clearly he wanted to to do yeah. this cover, um, which I, is something cool. I, I really – we got to get one of these guys on the show. Hell, maybe we'll get Jared at some point. But yeah. I wonder how that works. You know, is there a billboard of, hey, these are the books you can choose? And he's just like, that one, that one, that one's me. You know, just <laughs> flopping his name all over it. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's cool that he had so much excitement for this. Yeah, the, the intensity. Um, yeah, the intensity for it, for sure. Well, when you so, when you find a project that interests you, you want it to be yours. I mean, can you imagine if Michael Whalen's up there uh, and yeah. maybe it's Brom and those two guys get the shot at doing the Lovecraft covers? They're probably going to be like having a knockdown, drag out fight when he gets it right here. <laughs> right, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Watch it, see what you can do. <laughs> okay, so question two here. Did you have much input for what the cover should look like, or were you given free reign to design it? I had free reign for the most part. All of Matt Ruff's covers, like uh, The Mirage, Bad Monkeys, etc., are all pretty graphic and clever, so there was a good precedent to follow. Yeah, which, uh, folks, go ahead and check out Matt Ruff's other novels' covers. They are similar to this, but in in a different way. Uh, Jared... I really love it when authors' books have a theme that that runs with them. And this definitely has that graphic art feel where you look at it, and it's not so much uh, Michael Whalen, where it's this sprawling masterpiece work of all these intricate details, but it's this image that you see, and it's almost like you know product placement where you see it and it sticks in your brain instantly. You know what you I mean? You know exactly from one glance what's going on. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, you can look at it and you're like, whoa, what is that? I want to pick it up and look at it because it's true. Sometimes, you know, how many Anne McCaffrey novels have I looked at and been like, cool, cool, (laughs) dragon, dragon, dragon. But there's something about this Lovecraft country cover and even Mirage and Bad Monkeys, if you check those out, where you just like, whoa, that's different looking. Yeah, a little puzzle that's in there. Yeah, exactly. So, uh Really cool to hear that. Uh, so question three, what were your thoughts behind the design and look? What were you thinking when you created it? Well, as a nod to the Lovecraft medium, I wanted to make it look pulpy and weird, but with uh, some kind of uh, image with double meaning like Ruff's other covers. I also knew I had to convey the sense of darkness and <laughs> horror and of the racism that the book that the characters are confronted with in the book. That's how I landed on the Cthulhu head with the the white figures between the tentacles. And as we talked about, nailed it. You (laughs) nailed it, Jared. Uh, I mean, it's it's so impossibly effective. uh, And you you do this double take where you look at it. And uh, I didn't even think of the mountain as a Cthulhu head. That's great. But it makes sense with the tentacles. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Just Dropping a, his luscious locks down into America. Just blah, 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 just, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and yeah, and, and and stroking the the shitty racists for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, really well done. So um, yeah, really cool. So question four: What tools did you use to create this cover? Did you have any issues in its design? What are your favorite aspects of the piece? My process was a lot of sketching out ideas and then too much in design. The author wasn't crazy about the cover when he saw it, but luckily the editor really liked it. And so I was able to sell him. I was able to sell him. I think my favorite aspect of the piece is that we were able to switch the format to paper overboard instead of the jacket because it just fits better with the look. Now, First of all, folks, if I get a chance, I gotta ask, what what was Matt Ruff's idea? Yeah, because it sounds like 
you know? Yeah, you're. It's always curious when you when you see or hear about something getting rejected, um, and that becomes you know like, for example, uh, last ep- uh, season we talked about bad uh, black company, yeah. and how um, the cover for the first paperback edition of that was just that was just a stand in, and the publishers had no. Uh, I don't like it. I like yeah, it. Had no intention <laughs> of keeping that that uh, that cover. But then the bookseller was like, I'll buy 50,000 copies of whatever book has that cover on it. You know, so it's like, package well, it orig- get it ready, ship it to my store. Yeah. What was the original cover going to be? Yeah. You know, it makes you wonder. Was it going to be better? Was it going to be worse? Lost covers. The lost covers. Yeah. So really interesting, Jared. I mean, I'm sure you already know. You probably talked to the guy. Send us an email and we'll bring that up in another episode. But so interesting, folks, to see these, you know, these back and forth of like, nah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you know, in the end, I guess the publisher has a rule and Jared, honestly, I don't know what Matt, Matt's beef with it was if he had any, but yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, it's great. And yeah. I love, I love that the format was switched to paper overboard uh, instead of jacket because it, it really gives it that, yeah, that pulpy, pulpy look. Yeah. And, and yeah. what a cool dude too to like answer your questions uh, when you reached out to him because at the end of the, the email here he just says uh, thanks again and let me know if you need any more info That's, oh yeah Jared yeah, we give dude. you we give you our our biggest seal our fat juicy cover to cutter seal of mm. thanks and approval and you put that in whatever bam whatever sandwich you like and just enjoy how it yeah, tastes you put that up on the wall we'll send you a, a pixelated printout you can frame that <laughs> You get the cover decoder <laughs> seal of approval. That's stick it right. on the fridge. So <laughs> stick it on the fridge. So commemorative, uh, cup. folks. Huge thanks to Jared Taylor for uh, thank getting, you. Yeah, for giving yeah, us the thanks, inside man. info. Yeah, super cool, dude. We appreciate it. Hopefully, That's we'll the get ultimate back to decode you. when we can hear it straight from the artist. A lot of times, we do a lot of speculating, but uh, the tapes. Yeah, folks, our hard nosed reporter you- out there. We're getting you the interviews. We're getting you the true facts. And check out the links. Jared Taylor's website is on there. It's really well laid out. His covers are awesome. Yes. So once again, uh, thank you, Jared, uh, for that. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the book before we get into our, our final piece here. Uh, it's set in 1954, and it follows a series of characters in an interconnected story as they encounter the horrors of Jim Crow America, its racist, its racist denizens, as well as the supernatural and occult. Um, and its most pervasive element is, in fact, that racial uh, Im- immorality and bigotry that the characters face. Yes. Uh, but it's also a really good story. It's oh, a great story. You, you know what? It's, uh, w- folks, we all, we all read it. Um, yeah, we, finished. we all read it. I, don't, don't ruin it for me. I, I still have like 30 pages left. Um, oh. But. What you are what surprised for a treat, my friendy friend, friend, friend? What surprised me the most <laughs> about it is it wasn't as dark. It wasn't as dark, not at all, uh, as I thought it was mm. going to be. I love um, it. It's still it's still very disturbing. Uh, it's very horrific. the The racism in it is is hard to read. It's hard to read. Um, it makes you feel for the characters. It makes you angry. Um, right. But through it all. Um, the characters they prevail. Um, yeah, they overcome their situations. Uh, That's with- what almost makes it harder to read. Actually, uh, is that these characters they're just like this is how it is, and they know how to yeah. deal with the situations. Yeah. Uh, and and it's so messed up, it, you know that, and it really makes you think. It makes yeah. you think. Well, and it's like you know. It, there is there's some really good um, nerd morsels in there because if you're like us and you like to play RPG games and tabletop games and you like to imagine yourself as this this human traveling in a strange land where you're not welcome you're not wanted the the orcs yeah. won't let you into their cool bar um, you know you have to like you have to barter with the with the goblin merchant and everything these characters are living that but in America in the fifties and um, coming from that angle, it makes you really realize that they're living in this, um, this harsh land that most, most people don't 
um, experience. And and there's it's just it's a lot of fun because there's a lot of questing that goes on. You get to totally. um, experience different characters. It's almost like it's almost like a anthology, but it's all connected. It's really well done book. Now, yeah. what you should know about it is what I thought I was getting into is I thought I was getting into a Cthulhu mythos story. Yes, uh, great. Featuring people of color as the main characters. No, don't don't go in this book expecting that because it is not. Um, these stories are um, definitely sci-fi horror uh, stories. They definitely each story kind of picks a different trope. There is the cult. There is the ghost. There's the science gone wrong story, Space um, magic. but they're, you know, they're the, the traveling to another world, which is one of my favorite stories. Um, it. it just turns it on its head um, with Lovecraft um, as a metaphor, as a metaphor for yep. America. So Brengineer, Bre- thank you. You just gave us the perfect segue. Uh, and so where Matt Ruff got the idea as Brengineer was saying for these different stories is originally he wanted the show to be a TV series. In fact, he first pitched it. Yep. I believe it was in 2007, uh, as a TV series. Uh, and they, they wouldn't bite, they wouldn't take it. And he was doing a lot of reading at that point about sundown towns, uh, and all this, uh, all these different aspects of, uh, African Americans in America at that time. And he finally decided to just write it as a book. But what he wanted to do, he wanted to do it more like X-Files, where it was basically the show would be a different, oh. uh, a different Preacher episode. Preacher of the Week kind of deal. Yeah. Yes, following a different segment, which it totally is, except yeah. I love it too. Except in the book, he, he finally ties it all in together, yeah. which is really cool. There's no 14,000 seasons with a, with a season coming back. No. Right. But what's really cool is back in 2007, he wanted this to be a show. Fast forward all the way to 2020, where now Lovecraft Country is finally an HBO show. But what's really cool is you have Matt Ruff's take, and then HBO is basically all black directors, all black producers, and all black actors who get to then take this story. And then J.J. Abrams. Yeah, and J.J. Abrams, but, you know. Who cares about that guy? Anyway, and then they get he to take it. He supplied the lens flares. He supplied the <laughs> lens flares. Well, really, who we have to thank for this is Misha Green, because Misha yeah. Green and Jordan Peele uh, are the ones who, I guess, really uh, dug into and Matt Ruff and asked him to do this uh, and want to do it. And Misha is responsible for basically creating the show. And she had some really interesting things to say uh, about... Lovecraft especially. Uh, One of the things she said was uh, on reclaiming Lovecraft was, I think it was that thing that Matt was doing that I was really intrigued about, which is the idea of reclaiming it and not saying that we're going to honor all of your contributions to this genre. And there are many, but we're going to take that and we're going to acknowledge who you are as a person as well. And we're going to move forward. She added, and how we move forward is acknowledging that celebrating the good stuff taking the good stuff and then building on the good stuff. That was exciting to me and why I had no problem doing it because it was like moving forward. So again, you know, you have like, like, like they say in the book, you have these books and these sci-fi authors who the material doesn't necessarily love the reader back, you know, but we're in this time now where, uh, you know, Misha green and, and all the, the actors and the producers and the people now, they get to take that and they get to basically put their own their own words into it, their own spin into it, Invert which is really it. cool. Invert it, yeah. So let's take that and let's just go to the HBO show covers. Let's take a look at the posters here. Well, one of these right. is my favorite. Yeah, one of them is definitely my favorite. One, one's got some uh, some definite plastic CG tentacles. I'm not in love with. I guess they both have plastic CG tentacles. Uh, one I, I love more than the other. Um, so here's what, here's what we got. I'll, I'll go. I'll go. So go, go, you go. go. You go. The, the one I like is it's a very dark cover. It's uh, it's black and red and some gray, right? 
Uh, smack dab in the middle, you got Lovecraft Country. <clears throat> awesome white font with some uh, interesting sort of spiky bits on it. Nice red drop shadow. Uh, yeah. Very, very cool. Uh, it's got a road going right down the middle with a car, an old school yeah. car. And uh, a, f- a red field going down either side. And the light uh, from the headlights is illuminating these tentacles coming out from the field. Um, it's it's effective. It doesn't give anything away. No. Um, it's, it's Lovecraftian. It says, hey, this is horror. Hey, the time period is, you know, 50s or 60s. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's going to be dark. And it's got Jordan yes. Peele's name on it. And that means I'm going to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and after re- and I remember seeing this, and now that I've uh, read the book, it it makes a lot of sense because one of the important things about the book is travel and traveling and yes. safe travel. Um, even like one of the the items that's so important is the safe travel guide, which is kind of based on the Green Book, um, in which it would give safe places for Black people to um, to eat and stay when they're on the road and that gives a lot of meaning to this poster now that I look at it because you've got these these obstacles in the form of uh, tentacles, obstetentacles tentacles that are, are trying Obst- to trip tentacles. up the travelers as they're as they're just trying to get from um, one destination to the other. Well, I also love too. You're going into the darkness. You're going to the yeah, unknown. Unknown. You know that's what's cool. You're going to Lovecraft Country. What's going to be there? Uh, I don't know. Probably more shit that we have to deal with. <laughs> but it's there. Uh, works. I love, I love, I I love the floppy tentacle cover, because for me, uh, it's just so st- it's so striking. Well, it's so in your to? face. So I'm, are, I'm, are we talking? Are we talking the all other cover? I'm talking oh. about floppy tentacle. I'm talking about we got we got Atticus uh, front and center played by Jonathan Majors, and we got Letitia uh, played by uh, Journey Smollett. And they're sitting front and center. They're looking badass. And you got Lovecraft Country right up front. Take back your legacy, uh, which is super cool. And it just it's a very empowering cover uh, to me. It is. But for me, it gives the wrong message. Yeah. Oh, it's corny. It's corny for sure. It's corny. But this looks like, um, I don't know. This is going to be on some action. Alien. Action. Explosions. VHS. Explosions. Um, you know, I just, it just doesn't give yeah. the, it doesn't, it doesn't capture the atmosphere. You know, this well, looks like it could be an alternative cover for, uh, that movie evolution. You know, I'm just waiting for <laughs> David to come to like, uh, appear, yeah. uh, in the background there with his, uh, shampoo truck. Well, the thing, so, I, the thing I like about it is the actor's faces though. I mean, uh, a lot of times we rail against, you know, f- uh, just photographs of, uh, actors heads, but I, I think they portray the character characters pretty well, and at least their their um, personalities. And if you haven't read the book, you haven't totally. watched the show, you wouldn't know it. But afterwards, you may go back and go, "Oh yeah, that's that's it's exactly how Letitia would hold herself. That's exactly how Atticus." Would I hold was just herself. about to bring yeah. that up. So the badass thing I love about this is that they got Letitia in the front, oh, and if you perfect. read the book, Letitia is is the she's the warrior. boss. She's, she's the, she's the warrior. The group. The rogue. She to me, yeah. she fills the the role of the rogue and Atticus. No, nah, dude, of she's the, got the, the shotgun. Plotting. She's she's in there with a the racist ghost, being like, "We're gonna play chess. I'm gonna kick your ass." That's yeah, true. She's it's amazing. Tough. Like I said, it it may be a more schlocky cover, but I think it represents the ideals of the of the book pretty well. You know, it it gives a good foundation of, yeah. of what you're gonna see. It's it is it is a very empowering book, and it's about these characters who are dealing with some shit. They're dealing with some garbage, and they they deal with it like fucking bosses. Well, yeah, um, and there's stuff in there like I you don't realize like how bad it how bad it is, no. how bad it was. I mean, you hear yeah, there there was racist, but like I racism. I didn't know anything about sundown towns. You know, no, for sure. Um, yeah. It's just uh, it's eye opening. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, again, Matt Ruff, he did his research. Uh, he's got a bunch of, of books, folks. If you check out the book in the back um, for sources of some really good information. So definitely check it out. Read the book. Watch the show and enjoy the covers that you're going to see. Um, you like and- them. <laughs> like them 
And it's just really cool to see, again, um, people of color reclaiming this world that for so long they've, you know, they've been a part of, but they yeah. haven't been acknowledged in. Or even not even reclaiming you know? it, but repurposing it rather than burying yeah, it. Yeah, sure, for sure. Um, rebuilding it and making it something that um, can carry everyone forward. Yeah, and, and, and you know – like Misha said in that in that quote, not you know exposing who the people are so we can see that, yeah, and then yeah. and pointing out that you know this is wrong, and moving forward. Um, Inks actually gave me a great podcast, folks. Check it out, Imaginary Worlds. Check yeah. it out. But um, Victor Lavelle, Battle of the Black Tom, is a Lovecraft story, the yeah. horror at Red Hook, but from a black perspective, which is. Awesome, because yeah. that is one of his most racist stories. So a huge undertaking. Uh, there's a film called Cthulhu from two, uh, 2007, which uses the shadow over Innsmouth metaphor, which can very easy, easily be exploited. Lovecraft used it, unfortunately, as a, a racist metaphor. But in the film, they use it as a metaphor to show the horror faced by a gay man returning to a small town. And the struggles that he has to face dealing with that. Um, and it's, and it's a well done film. So there are so many authors and creative people who are stepping up yeah. and they're not, they're not running away from this. Yeah. They're looking it in the face and they're basically giving the big fucking tentacle master, yeah. the middle finger and saying, we're doing this ourselves. Yeah. You think you know so, what it's like to be insignificant? Let me tell you. Yeah, exactly. What is the Lovecraft legacy? Does he deserve one? Should we erase him? Or should we try to remove his racist legacy from his writings? This is kind of where my introspections on this episode have led. And I think my voice here will agree with me. Uh, Lovecraft undoubtedly caused damage with his writings. People read his stuff. They have read his stuff. But the people that are reading it now are dismantling that horrible legacy it left behind. People are taking that cement that Lovecraft layered for cosmic horror and all its subgenres, and they're redefining it and using it to show those struggles and horrors in their own life experiences. You know? They're taking those things and, and they're and they're flipping them and they're yeah. using them. Uh I also believe Lovecraft is a man who needs to be remembered because like so many other people, he's a beacon of what not to become. No, he's a representation. Exactly. Yeah. He's a representation of what to be better than, uh, especially in the artistic form folks. Uh, we all know a Lovecraft in some form, you know, we know a person who's, you know, smart in many ways, maybe a genius in some, but they have another a side that's harmful and dangerous, uh, and maybe it's not as blatant as Lovecraft, you know? Uh, maybe it's not super racist. Maybe it's something Sometimes else. Sometimes subtlety in certain areas can be worse than um, outright of oh, anything. Oh, yeah. That happens, it, that happens in the book. The most dangerous yes. character is the most subtle. Exactly. So this is another great example for us because Lovecraft lived in an era where his views would have been – probably more accepted than rejected, I hate to say, or at least not really dismissed. No one really would have said anything against him. But we don't have that excuse now. We know better, and we can look at the Lovecrafts around us, and we can tell them to stop, you know? We can question, and we can make people question themselves, you know? Yep, we can absolutely. write We can write stories. We can push things into a new era where art yes. is for everyone. So... Uh, as I said, yeah, art is great. It's beautiful. We love it. uh, but as we've learned again on this show, it can be destructive. So basically, this is my closing thought, folks. Don't bury Lovecraft. Expose him. Expose him. Expose him. Take the, expose him. Take the innovative tools he created and reforge them for something good. Yeah. That's Take my opinion. Suck Lovecraft dry of his goodness and leave his foul husk behind um, <laughs> when when you're using him um, uh, as a creative influence. Yeah. Um, Lovecraft is history to be studied. Lovecraftian is a genre to be explored and defined by all 
people. Well, that's yes, right. Sir. Well, thank you so much, um, Tapes, for that awesome um, foray into a tough topic. Um, tough topic. Yeah, I, yeah. I have seen a lot of arguments about Lovecraft. Um, and like other artists who have um, damaging viewpoints, um, I've seen similar fights about. Um, it is easier just to say, eh, screw that guy. I have nothing to do with him or yeah. anything like it. Um, right. The more constructive thing to do, I believe, is to engage, reveal, reveal the damaging aspects, um, engage it, defeat it, um, repurpose it. Yeah. Yeah. And if I may real quick insert uh, one last final quote, this is by John Jennings. He uh, illustrated a uh, box of bones, which is a graphic novel. Oh, He's a black a good artist. Cover. Such a good cover. Uh, again, that, that podcast, check it out. Uh, hilarious dude. But he said, I don't like shutting someone down. I like discourse. Don't cancel it. Engage it. Uh, and he followed it up with, I know it's pretty petty, but he knew that Lovecraft would hate that he was doing Lovecraftian artwork. Yeah. You know what I mean? So again, just following up on Brengineer's point, uh, it's, it's better to take something shitty and remold it. Yeah. So with that, uh, we want to thank you all um, for being part of this journey as we uncover the mystery behind these covers. Yes, season yes. two. Our website is coverdecoder.com. If you have questions, comments, or covers, please send us your covers. Please, covers. Yeah, send us the covers. We love covers. We love covers. We would also love to hear from you guys. Yeah. If, seriously, if you have any comments about the show, let us know. We'd love right to here. talk yeah. about it. We, want, we, we know we're not perfect. We want to do better. We want this. We want to crystallize the show into a perfect entity. Yes. So That's if right. you, if you can see any way we can make this better, please let us know. Um, you can send those, uh, those comments, those questions, those covers to cover decoder at gmail.com. Also check us out on Instagram, uh, at cover decoder. Please like review and follow us on whatever platform you're listening to. It helps us out a ton and we are forever Grateful. So grateful. Yeah. And remember, with great covers come great responsibilities. <laughs> oh!